make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> The early church, the early Christian church, is a colonized group of people. They are coming from the dregs of Roman society. They are people who, I mean, Jesus is executed by the Roman Empire for political reasons, right? It's not it's not his theology that gets him killed. It is that he is perceived as a threat to the Roman ruling order in Judea, and that they don't want to have any more rebellions by the Jewish people. And so they're, they're in the business of executing messiahs just to prove they aren't messiahs, right? And so Jesus is, is a victim of this colonial military industrial complex. As that's going on though, people in the, the, the New Testament, the, the different writers in the New Testament are also watching. Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and watchers. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Doing well. Thanks, Will. Um, and today we have with us returning uh, Matthew Taylor. He's a religious study scholar and expert in independent charismatic Christianity and Christian nationalism. He's a creator, writer, narrator, narrator of the Charismatic Revival Fury audio documentary series on the Straight White American Jesus podcast stream and has a new book, The Violent Ticket by Force, The Christian Movement That is Threatening Our Democracy. So welcome back to the show, Matt. Thank you guys for having me. It's always good to be here. Yes. Yeah. So like you've been really, really busy over the past couple months. Uh, I mean, you're writing a book. You're like you're talking about, you know, the appeal to heaven flags. Like I, I haven't read a single like like article about the new apostolic reformation that has not referenced you in some form or capacity. So I, I got to know, like, how are you handling all this newfound fame? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I wish that my research subjects would actually stay out of the news sometimes because <laughs> I think it would be better for our country in many ways if they were not so prominently featured. But because they are um, doing what they're doing and are so uh, invested in this election, I think to, to very nefarious ends, um, I, I, uh, I, I'm getting called a lot by the media and, and I'm, I'm always happy to talk to reporters. I, it, but I, I find I often slip into kind of professor mode with, with reporters of like, okay, let's, let's go like do a little kind of religious landscape, history, all these sorts of things. Cause the, the, the the truth is, it's just very hard to understand these folks using kind of conventional paradigms of Christianity. So yeah. I, yeah. I'm educating I, I, a lot. And I'd, I'd imagine like like you, you probably have like your your NAR pitch down like pretty good because, I mean, it's it's like a complicated topic, right? I mean, and most of the times you're getting interviewed and they're only using like, you know, three sentences of like your 30 minute long like discussion. Like, like how, how do you, how do you, how do you convey the seriousness of the new apostolic reformation, you know, in such a short amount of time while still, you know, trying to, I don't know, convince or, or bring awareness to, to the issue. Well, and part of the, this is some of what um, I'm trying to do in the book as well is I'm actually trying to move away from simply talking about the NAR because the NAR is a, is a particular set of leadership networks. Um, it's it's a fairly contained little ecosystem historically. But what has happened in uh, really the last three or four years, uh, mostly since January 6th, but especially since 2015, is that these NAR ideas and these NAR paradigms, the, these um, styles of leadership have spread very far outside of the New Apostolic Reformation proper. And now we are seeing this activated world of independent charismatic leadership that is in many ways taking over the, the religious right in America. And now front, the frontline leaders in most local um, counties and school board takeovers and all these attempts, and at the national level, many of the, the, the movers and shakers of the Christian right are now these independent charismatic celebrities who are inspired by the NAR. Um, and so I'm trying to, to kind of help people understand the seismic shift that is going on in the culture of the religious right, because I think that that is at the heart 
of, of a lot of this more aggressive posture we're experiencing from uh, a lot of Christians in the country right now. And it's a theological shift. It's a social shift. It's, it's, it's a socioeconomic shift in many cases. And, and it's just a very hard thing to wrap your head around until you kind of see it up close. And these reporters are seeing it up close and saying, like, help me make sense of this. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And one of the things you talk about in your book is a concept of almost like theology as this driving force and following the theology in this radicalization of the American right wing politics. And, and then, of course, even some of the stuff you outlined is that going beyond, right, just America, right. Um, particularly in the global south. So what is this? What, what does it mean to follow the theology? Kind of help us understand how is this theology driving, how is it a driving force in behavior, in, in the way that they're speaking and talking and promoting things? And why is this concerning? Because I think about theology as a driving force. It's a driving force in my life. I would want it to be a driving force in people's lives of good behavior, of you know care, of all sorts of different things, right? Or theology or deeply held beliefs. So I don't think it's negative in and of itself, but what what is the concerning part about about this? Part of what I'm trying to get at in the book is um, I think we we have certain habits of mind in in our public discourse and how we approach religion, and um, especially for journalists, um, and especially I'd say um, since probably the 1950s or 1960s, um, that that the mentality is follow the money. Right. And if you just track the money, then you can understand why people are doing what they're doing. And it's, it's sort of this like you can reduce everything to economics and people's economic interests. And so when when you apply that to religious leaders, it's often, oh, this is all about money for them. And, and this is a very, very much a trope, especially when we're talking about this independent charismatic world. I mean, this is the world of the prosperity gospel. This is the world of televangelism. Right. And so people have this 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 structure to their way of thinking, oh, this must just be about people's own economic interests. And part of the argument I'm trying to make in the book is if you're only thinking from that lens, you can't understand the people we're talking about. And you can't understand that what motivates and drives them. Because the for and, and, and I try to go back and, and, and follow this. I actually think in many ways the the story of January 6th begins in the 1990s, at least the religious story of January 6th begins in the 1990s. And I trace it back because a lot of the leaders who show up on January 6th get radicalized in the 1990s. And, and there's kind of an incubation period of that radicalization. And I'm trying to show relationally and, and, and theologically, what was the process by which people got to this point? How did they get to this form of Christianity that many Christians wouldn't even recognize? That many Christians would say, wait, <laughs> you believe modern apostles and prophets are generals of spiritual warfare who are leading a mass campaign to displace high-level demons who control literal physical territory and have taken over the U.S. Capitol and all to stop Donald Trump, right? Like, why do the demons just want to stop Donald Trump? Right? I mean, it, 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 there's, <laughs> there's all these logical leaps that are going on, but it, if you actually understand the theology, you recognize there were some Christians who, when Trump came along, were very reluctant and wound up voting for him, holding their noses. These were the folks who were prepared for someone like Donald Trump, who were looking for someone like Donald Trump, and who, when he came on the scene, jumped on board the Trump train and have been in many ways the part the drive put it, pushing fuel into the engine of the, the Trump campaigns and have been the, the propagandists for Donald Trump in among American Christians. <laughs> That's you know what's what's funny is when you when you strung along the sort of like like a uh, thought thread of everything that that some people think like I, I don't think I've ever heard it like I've I've, I've, I've I, I'm familiar with the pieces but when you sort of like string it along it makes me think that like Christians have like this this other universe you know like I just saw Deadpool right so so like there's this earth I don't know like 316 <laughs> where, where where in this Christian multiverse uh you know we have we're like Q, QAnon adjacent um we believe in you know underground kid whatever and pizza factories or something and like it's it's just really wild so 
um, that that wasn't really my question at all, but I, I just wanted to, 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 to throw that out there. But I want to talk about the title of your book, though. So the violent ticket by force, like like wh- wh- where where is that where is that title from? Like, because for me, it just connotates. I don't know, like like I, I think of January 6th when I think of that title, but but I, I feel like there's probably a little bit more depth to it. When I started digging in to January 6th, which was right after uh, January 6th, basically, um, I mean, within a week of January 6th happening, I, I was <laughs> staying up late at night just trying to understand the, the social world, the theological world, the leaders who had been involved in this. Um, and um, I, I just kept coming across this verse from Matthew chapter 11, the violent take it by force. It was, it was uh, for the people who participated in January 6th, many of them were Christians and many of them were constantly referencing the Bible. And this was one of the references that kept coming up and up and up. And um, the, the the passage it comes from um, is is one where Jesus is having an argument about his his cousin, John the Baptist, who's just been executed. And, um, and he, he makes this cryptic comment in Matthew chapter 11, where he says, since the days of John the Baptist, right, <laughs> which is almost immediate, like just within a few months uh, of, of him speaking, uh, where his cousin's been executed, uh, since the days of John the Baptist, um, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Christians have been very divided historically about how to read this passage. It's, it's, it's one of these kind of uh, like cryptic, mystical sayings that Jesus has. Many, many people historically have interpreted this as to be a Christian is, is to suffer violence, that, that to, to follow in the way of Jesus is to experience violence. And he's pointing to the case of his case study of his cousin to say, this is what it means to be a person of God is, is to experience persecution. Others have said that Jesus is being metaphorical, here, oh, this is, this, he's kind of saying you need to be aggressive in trying to grab hold of the kingdom of God and in using a metaphor of violence to, 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 to talk about that. Within the New Apostolic Reformation and many independent charismatic uh, networks, this verse is used as the premise for spiritual warfare. The premise for Christians' involvement in this cosmic, invisible combat all around them. And in fact, um, one of the central characters of my book, really, in many ways, the central character of my book is a, a man named C. Peter Wagner. And this was one of his favorite verses. And he would say um, in some of his writings that um, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, the, the people of God were violent physically. The people of God would, would take cities, would conquer nations. And in the New Testament, in the, in the era of Jesus, this verse, Matthew 11, is, is the mandate for Christians to be spiritually violent. And part of what we see, and this is the trajectory I trace, is that there's this buildup, this, this crescendo of spiritual violence, of, of, of spiritual warfare rhetoric, of, of violent attacks in the kind of rhetorical spiritual space on the Democratic Party, on the American Democratic system, on disloyal Republicans, and all of this comes to a head on January 6th, where you actually see all of the spiritual violence tip over into real violence. All of the rhetoric, all of the the, the buildup, all of that uh, um, angst that has been produced kind of breaks loose on January 6th. And I'm trying to show how, how did Christians get to that that idea? How did Christians get to that point of thinking that violence is necessary, that violence is a part of their spirituality, even though, I mean, at least the way that most of us think about Christianity, it's one of the furthest things from our spirituality. Yeah. And 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 I'm curious, like, is, is the propensity to want to be violent, isolated to any particular denomination? Um, and and uh, if so, like, how does that tie into like something that you explained in the book, which I've never um, seen it explained as well as as you did the the four quadrant model of American Christianity? I thought that that was really kind of kind of neat. So can you can you talk about the denominations that are more prone to be violent and then um, and then the four quadrant? Yeah, and I, I'm not arguing in any way that that um, some particular denomination or strand of Christianity is inherently violent, and and all the others are fine or anything along those lines. I mean, if you look back through Christian history, many different kinds of Christians have perpetuated many different kinds of violence, um, and I mean the Crusades, pogroms, the 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 
Protestant reformations that we often herald among American Protestants produced decades of brutal warfare in Europe that 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 were often lacing together theology and politics in, in a way that I think would feel very familiar to many people in America today right so it's not it's not that that oh that, that there there are good christians and the bad christians i think in many ways th- th- this call to christian violence implicates all christians and i think it's something we all need to 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 grapple with what what i'm trying to show with this the four quadrants I'm, we we get in, into certain categories and and channels of thinking about American Christianity, certain certain ways, kind of fixed neuralgic ways of thinking about American Christianity. And so especially with American Protestantism, the, the conventions that have come to, to, to reign tend to be, you have historically black Protestants, you have evangelicals, and you have mainline Protestants. And those kind of are in the in the ether, in the vocabulary of how we talk about these. The challenge is the, the folks who are talking about charismatics and Pentecostals, they cut across all of those categories. And so I'm using the four quadrants as a way to um, kind of delineate who we're actually thinking about in, in when we're talking about the NAR. And so the, the, the way to think about the four quadrants is there's kind of two axes. Are they denominational? Yes or no. Are they charismatic? Yes or no. And by charismatic here, just to, to, as a reminder, we're not talking about oh, are, are are they uh, magnetic in their personality? Are they are they interesting to watch? We're we're saying in in <laughs> Christianity, right? Charismatic is the, the, these this the spirituality that um, has emerged within the last hundred and twenty hundred and thirty years um, that is centered on trying to recapture the supernatural dimensions of early Christianity. And I am not anti-charismatic. I, I grew up um, uh, in many ways in a kind of charismatic evangelical household. Um, and uh, I, I have many friends who are charismatic. So this is not, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to say good Christians, bad Christians or anything. So, but if you think about those four quadrants, so the first quadrant will be how most of us think about American Protestantism, especially, right? Denominational and not charismatic. And so those would be the Southern Baptists, the Presbyterian Church of America, right? Mo- many of the, the Protestant denominations, the mainline denominations by and large, most Catholics would be in that first quadrant. The second quadrant would be non-denominational and not charismatic. And these are typically kind of ex-fundamentalist churches, um, often Calvinist churches that are independent. They don't, they don't want to be associated with the denomination, but they're often very anti-charismatic, in fact. Um, and then the third quadrant will be where we, both charismatic and denominational, which is where you'd find the Pentecostals, uh, the, Catholic, the Catholic charismatics. There's many, uh, especially around the globe right now, many Catholics are adopting this charismatic spirituality. Amy Coney Barrett, the Supreme Court Justice, grew up in a charismatic Catholic community. And then um, the fourth right. quadrant. Matt, Matt, r- 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 real fast yeah. before you you explain, it, I just I just want just a point of clarification. Like um, for the third quadrant you just talked about, is is Pentecostal? Is like is that considered a denomination? I I, I had always thought that like when you say the word Pentecostal, you're talking about like healings and snake charmers and all kinds of other stuff. Yeah, so there's a nuance there in the U.S. When we talk about Pentecostalism, uh, it typically codes as being denominationally Pentecostal. So the Pentecostalism is a uh, the, is a movement that begins in the early 20th century um, in the U.S. It's especially focused around Los Angeles and the Azusa Street Revival that breaks out in 1906 and 1907. Um, but um, it's it's really a global movement. This is the same thing that's happening at Azusa Street is happening all around the world at the time. It's kind of this um, uh, diverse spread this diffuse movement that is uh, people hearing rumors about these ideas of modern day use of speaking in tongues or different spiritual gifts and this th- these ideas spread around the world very rapidly but in the US th- what happens is the, denom- the, the the pentecostals adopt this denominational model and there's mm-hmm. a there's a racial fracture pretty early on in the movement. At the beginning, especially at Azusa Street, it was a very multi-ethnic. You had Latino and black and white people all kind of worshiping together and experiencing these things together. It was led by an African-American pastor. And then um, racism <laughs> asserts itself within the movement fairly rapidly. And so today you, in, in America, most of the Pentecostal denominations are tend, tend to be understood as either a black 
Pentecostal denomination or a white, predominantly white Pentecostal denomination. So like the Church of God in Christ would be a, 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 the, one of the major large black Pentecostal denominations or in the Assemblies of God or the Four Square would be coded as more of the white, predominantly white Pentecostal denominations. Um, but no, most it, it, around the world, it gets a lot more messy to talk about that. And, and Pentecostalism around the world can connote different things. But within the U.S., yeah, when people say I'm Pentecostal, typically it means that they are attached to a Pentecostal denomination. And then the fourth quadrant is where we really, I mean, the, the, most of the book takes place looking at people in the fourth quadrant. So this is where you have this mix of non-denominational and charismatic. And part of the, the point I'm trying to make there is when we get back to this question of violence, what is unique about this fourth quadrant is you have the energy of charismaticism, which is, which is a very vibrant and, 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 and um, inspiring and exciting energy, right? That, that you can access directly the supernatural realm, but then it's mixed with this very, very low governance of non-denominational settings where there's very few guardrails and there's very little tradition. There's very little sense of even in the immediate past, right? It's, it's, this is a world that is fast moving and entrepreneurial and a, an open marketplace where new leaders are always popping onto the scene. And, and it's that mixture I think that 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 is is very important for understanding what happens on January sixth, and I have tracked sixty independent charismatic leaders to Washington D.C. on January sixth, more than I can find in hmm. any other form of Christianity. Hmm. Part of it is those folks that that sector of American Christianity was the most ardent Trump supporters among American Christians. The, this was the vanguard of Christian Trump support, but it's also because I think <laughs> if you think about it just practically. If you're a pastor in a denomination and you show up on January 6th and get arrested, your denomination is going to have something to say about that, right? And, and there, there's going to be yeah. consequences. But for a lot of these folks, they exist in this autonomous world that they there's no one checking them. There's no one holding them in line. There's no traditions that are uh, dictating how they operate. And so they have this great flexibility that I think contributes directly to their participation that day. You know, what's so funny to me is that so you're talking about like Pentecostalism and we're talking about it like as this kind of object that we're studying and wondering about, you know, but I grew up in the Assemblies of God. My dad was in denominational leadership, a superintendent in the Assemblies of God. I went to an Assemblies of God college. I'm getting my master's degree from an Assemblies of God college. I just got it. Um, from Evangelion University or some who's a God theological seminary and talking about Pentecostalism. And yet I resigned my credentials with the Assemblies of God for some theological issues. My wife is an ordained minister in the Assemblies of God, as are my, my two parents, uh, my mom and my dad and my brother and one of my brothers. And I have deep connections and yet I have a church that's non-denominational. It's not associated with any like specific denomination. And I did that intentionally. And I would consider myself charismatic in my theology in the sense that, you know, I believe that gifts can gifts of the spirit can happen. I believe that miracles are possible, all those things. And yet I find myself so uh, at odds with nar so at odds with the pentecostalism and charismatic uh culture honestly and in many ways just find myself like i don't it's not repulsed that's not a good word and i love i i but i don't know repelled maybe pushed back i i love so many people within the denomination i have nothing like it's been really good for me. I loved growing up in the assemblies, but now being in this position now and looking at some of the ways that, particularly where you're talking about, right, the assemblies is this large, very organized structure, all of that. And then this non-denominational charismatic leaders and the ways in which they're driving forward some things that I'm just, I feel so... Uh, I feel so upset about in in my soul and in my spirit. And it's just interesting to talk about it because I feel like I am part of that, but then I'm not, I'm not part of it. I feel like an outsider in it. 
And, you know, you're thinking about like, well, I guess I, I have a trouble, but I have a, I have a question, but I, I'll let you respond if there's anything you wanted to respond to in, in that. I, I think that's so interesting, Josh. And I, I, I've had that experience quite a bit, actually, because I've, I've interviewed a lot of people in that, that world. And um, the, it, it, it's in some ways a microcosm of what's happened in broader evangelicalism, right? Where you have in 2016, 81% of white evangelicals in 2020, probably 82, 83%, depending on which survey you're looking at of white evangelicals voting for Donald Trump. Um, and, and, and yet what, what happens to the 19 or the 18%, right? Of, of these evangelical folks who resist that. And especially within this independent charismatic sector, um, I, I've encountered a number of leaders who are very anti-Christian nationalists, very frustrated with what they see going on around them. And yet they, they, in their friendship circles, in their relational circles, they they see the 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 rot of this Christian Trumpism spreading, and and in, in many cases mm-hmm. it is yeah the 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 the, the, the reaction that experiences a sense of revulsion and, and a sense almost of of betrayal. Like I thought we were all on the same page. I thought we were all working together. Um, one of the, the the people that I have met in the course of my research is actually somebody who is a very close friend of Lance Wall now, who's one of the central characters of my book spent decades being being extremely close friends with Lance Wallnow and today can't speak with him because of the it's politics awful. and and because Lance has really gone round the bend with a lot of the stuff and and is is almost not living in reality and and that's the that that's the the grit of what's going on in American Christianity right now is that it's not just oh there's some group of Christians out there that are supporting Trump that group of Christians are people's brothers and sisters and, and neighbors, right? And and this is fracturing American families, right? Millions of American families yeah. are having these theopolitical arguments, or they've no had doubt. those theopolitical arguments already, and now they can't talk to each other, right? And and that there's this this division. It's almost almost a, an epistemic division of how you know Absolutely. what you know, how you experience the world. That is 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 it's a rift. In, in the fabric of of our of our society, and I, I'm trying to figure out where did that come from? Who who, who led us Me into too. this mess, right? And that that's kind of where I'm trying to get in the book. Who who were the people who threw the doors open to that that experience, and that that we are now all kind of trapped in and living through? Yeah, and I want to I want to give you an opportunity to kind of trace that because my my question has to do with Paula White, but even moving from Paula White. To Amy Simple McPherson, right, or going there and bringing it to Paula White, kind of give us the sketch to understand, like, how did we end up with Paula White as the spiritual advisor to President Trump? Because everyone wants to throw, like, hey, President Trump, it's all him. Like, it's like this, he's all evil. And I I don't think that. I, I think he's a human like anyone else. Maybe he's a narcissist. Whatever I I don't like I, I I get scared of his pol not of his policies necessarily, but I get concerned for sure about his kind of like I I think he loves it that people worship him if I'm just honest I think like I think that's why he lo- he's buddy buddy with Kim Jong Un and all these guys because like hey they they got they figured out how to get people to worship them like a god I, I like that I think he he wants that just but that's just me but trace that though because. We tend to like just throw at one person or this and, and just kind of these blanket statements, but it's much more complex than that. Yeah, as much as this is a book about the formation of Christian Trumpism and the long term trajectory of Christian Trumpism, I very intentionally tried to push Donald Trump into the background. Right. I, I, I don't want to get into how much he actually believes what he believes. All, all those questions, I, I just kind of want them to recede a little bit so we can focus in on these Christian leaders who surround him, who propagandize him, who theologize him. Um, and, and Paula White, I think, is, is a, a, an extremely underestimated figure in American Christianity. I think she is one of the most important Christian leaders in the country today, for good or for ill. Um, and she's a fascinating character. I mean, she she grew up, was born in Mississippi, has an incredibly traumatic childhood, full of abuse. Her father evidently commits suicide. Her mother has an alcohol problem. I mean, just comes out of, out of some of the most difficult circumstances you can imagine. Um, and, and then encounters Pentecostalism and becomes, uh, 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 marries into a kind of Pentecostal church, 
winds up falling in love with her pastor. They both get divorced, and they, they Randy White uh, becomes her husband, and they found this um, pioneering megachurch, one of the top m- most attended megachurches in the country in Florida in the 1990s and early 2000s. They, they're preaching the prosperity gospel. They get hauled in for a Senate investigation by Chuck Grassley. I mean, just, just a really wild story. But in 2002, Paula White is a televangelist in Florida and gets a call out of the blue from Donald Trump. He was at Mar-a-Lago and had seen her preaching on TV. And he says to her, you have the it factor, <laughs> a very Trump thing to say. And her, her very fascinating rejoinder is, sir, we call that the anointing. And, and she becomes, over the course of the early 2000s, a, a very trusted spiritual advisor for Trump and almost a sort of personal pastor to him. Wow. And, um, and she was doing this for Kid Rock and, and Michael Jackson. I mean, this was, he was one of the many celebrities she was ministering to in addition to having this televangelism and megachurch ministry. And so then in 2015, when, when Trump declares that he's going to run for president, he turns to Paula White and says, will you be my liaison to the evangelicals? And it creates this fascinating and very um, uh, pivotal uh, moment where Paula White doesn't know the mainstream religious right. She doesn't know the quadrant one and quadrant two leaders who are at the heart of the religious right at the time. She knows televangelists. She knows apostles and prophets and messianic rabbis and mega church pastors. And those are the people that she brings in to start meeting with Donald Trump in the fall of 2015. And um, that really, uh, that becomes the nucleus of his evangelical advisors. So those are the first people to really endorse him. These people who, in the in the eyes of broader evangelicalism, would be very fringe are suddenly being brought into the center of things. And then as Trump wins over the course of that, the, the primaries in the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, suddenly you have all these influential evangelical figures, the, 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 the A-listers of the religious right, are having to come hat in hand to Paula White to get access to the Republican candidate. And it, there's this flip of power. And, and I have this little interlude in, the, in my chapter about her where I do go back and think about Amy Sipple McPherson, this um, truly incredible figure. I, if, I, I wish that somebody, I mean, I know there's, there's been a Broadway play about Amy, but the, the, they're, they're really, I, I wish she was somebody who was more studied and, and, and read about in American history. She's just a really interesting figure. Pente- one of the first Pentecostal leaders pioneers um, many uh, uh, or forms of radio televangelism and then and then ultimately later televangelism. Um, she creates the Foursquare denomination. She founds Angelus Temple in Los Angeles. In fact, my great grandfather knew Amy Simple McPherson. He was he was a, a pastor in Los Angeles. He didn't really like her that much. He he was a Presbyterian and thought she was she was a little out of control. But he did say he would he would say, I, I believe that um, God got Amy Simone McPherson to do the things that she did because he could never get a man to do it, right? So there, there was this kind of begrudging respect of here is this woman. And, and this is part of the story of Pentecostalism and charismaticism is it has been a remarkable force for empowering female voices and giving, and, and, and I mean, mainline Protestants like me sometimes pat ourselves on the back. Oh, we, we started ordaining women in the 1950s. The Pentecostals were doing it 50 years earlier, right? And so the, the, there's been, there, this, there's this paradox in the story of Paula White is that she is a character who has broken all these glass ceilings, right? And we're right now watching as, as Kamala Harris and is trying to do this at the presidential level. Paula White is a, is a very empowered woman, but then she's also used that power to backstop Donald Trump. And, and she's actually the figure, the person, the only official prayer offered on January 6th is Paula White at the beginning of the rally before Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani and all these folks provoke the crowds to go and storm the Capitol. She's the first woman, to, first female religious leader to pray at a presidential inauguration and the first religious leader to preside over an insurrection. That's, that's pretty wild. Huh? Like, that's like super wild, man. <laughs> and the paradox is like the tension you feel, right? I mean, empowering women and then like, I don't know. Like, you're just like, man, but empowering like this anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So, so like, um, in, in one of your chapters, um, it titled, um, worship as a weapon. Um, one, you know, can you explain what that's all about? And then two, um, who the heck is Sean Fute? Um, that, Foyt, Foyt. Okay. I wasn't sure. Uh, <laughs> who, who's mentioned quite a bit in that chapter. Yeah. So the, a lot of the book we're, we're trying to understand, 
this um, independent charismatic idea of spiritual warfare, right? Which, if, if for the uninitiated, is is basically just the idea that there are angels and demons battling all around us, and that that the, this invisible spiritual battle affects human beings, and that Christians can participate in that battle through practices like prayer. Uh, exorcism, th- th- ways of, of kind of interacting with this spiritual realm. Um, and But in the independent charismatic world in particular, they've really dialed up this conception of spiritual warfare. And the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation leaders, have been instrumental in in, in galvanizing people around these, these ideas of spiritual warfare. And many of the NAR leaders actually have mentored Sean Foyt. He, he's a young guy. He's younger than I am. He's, he's um, I think he just turned 40. And um, He's uh, a, a worship leader. Um, he comes out of um, Bethel Church in Redding, California. Before that, he was mentored by a number of these NAR leaders. And um, he he becomes a, almost an overnight celebrity in 2020. I mean, he, he had run for Congress, actually, in 2020 and lost pretty badly um, in, in California. But then he he starts staging these worship protests. And and part of his message is that worship is our weapon. Worship is a way of doing spiritual warfare, but it's also a way of doing cultural warfare. And what he starts doing as he's, it starts out as we're protesting these California COVID restrictions and it's unfair to Christians. And and it starts out in, in, in a somewhat kind of rational, reasonable, we're, we're fighting over policy. We're fighting over uh, whether congregations and religious bodies should be able to gather. But of course, this is the summer of 2020. And this is just weeks um, after you you have the George Floyd murder, as you have Black Lives Matter protests um, uh, in, in cities all around the country. And, and Sean Foy starts targeting these Black Lives Matter protests and showing up to lead these worship concerts very provocatively, very much in your face, trying to, to force his message into those spaces. He goes to Portland and has has, has his supporters have battles with Antifa. He goes to Seattle and they, they, they're they fighting with the, the, the occupiers of, the, of this kind of two block area in the middle of Seattle. So he's very intentionally trying to get attention, draw down persecution on himself, and he becomes so popular through this. I mean, he become, he's hanging out with Donald Trump. He's hanging out with Ron DeSantis. He's hanging out with Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and all these figures on the far right. But part of what I'm trying to get at there is in, in the contemporary world, in contemporary evangelicalism, um, worship music has become an industry unto itself. There's this kind of worship music industrial complex. And many of the elements, many of the churches, many of the, the organizations behind that worship music industrial complex are also backstopping Donald Trump and are also using worship as, as a way of provocatively inserting religion into our public debates. And you can see that. I mean, Sean Foyt goes and, and, and leads worship concerts at political rallies for Republican figures. Right? These are secular political rallies, ostensibly. They're just, it's just about kind of Republican Party things. But then you have this worship music going on. And this has helped to enculturate the, the, the right wing of America, the far right of America, to think of themselves as the true worshipers of God who are standing against the, the idolatry and demonic realm that is, surrounds them. And um, I think that has had a, a very harmful effect, not only on American Christianity, but on our politics. Because, I mean, look look at the, the, the way that, look at the rest of the country. There's all kinds of Christians who are also worshiping, but they are kind of presenting themselves as the righteous worshipers. And they're saying the righteous way to worship is to do it in people's faces, to be provocative. And I would say, as a Christian, I would point back to the teachings of Jesus. I, I think Jesus had quite a bit to say about people who use worship to do other things. Yeah, I was wondering, so like, well, <laughs> this is kind of a, a, a strange question that I don't know if you or maybe even Josh might know, but like, if he's out there doing worship songs, like, does he have to pay dues to like CCM, you know, to like <laughs> utilize these, these songs in a public? CCLI, he's got to have a CCLI. CCLI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, probably. I'm sure that throwing it on like YouTube and stuff would get him... <laughs> I could get him copyright issues, dude, if he's not, you know, I mean, we're, we get hit with uh, trying to just put some, you know, just some regular music in there when we're trying to do our videos. I can only imagine, dude, if you got like, <laughs> you know, millions of views or whatever, it's like, uh, 
Yeah. We're not there yet, Will, but we will get there. Yeah, millions well, of views. I mean, like if if he's singing, you know, I don't know, like an elevation song or uh, I don't know, hill song. I'm not sure if you can still sing hill song anymore. But like, but but like, if he's singing that, why aren't, why aren't these other organizations saying, hey, don't don't use our worship songs when you're when you're about to lead an insurrection? You know, just <laughs> all news, all all, all uh, what is it? All press is good press, I guess. <laughs> I mean that that is voice mentality. But I mean the the, the truth is. How, how do you explain that we, at, on January 6th, in the middle of a riot, there are groups of Christians standing around singing worship songs, like yards from the Capitol building? Yeah. In fact, some of them go into the Capitol building and are singing worship music, right? To, to, to most people's eyes, I think that looks bizarre until you understand this culture that has developed around worship music and how worship music is being integrated into far-right messages and 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 Sean Foyt has one of the largest worship platforms out there, Bethel Music, that that is coming out of yeah. this kind of NAR adjacent apostolic and prophetic world. Bethel is is one of the brands, one of the major worship brands in America today. And Foyt, that that that's Foyt's platform. That's where he comes from. And so I think sometimes we can think of this as like, oh, he's kind of a fringe figure or he's an exceptional figure. But then you recognize he's actually a pivotal figure in this huge industry that touches almost all American evangelicals. Yes. And so he's, he's, he, he's an outlier in some ways, but he's also quite integrated in to the landscape of American evangelicalism. Yeah, that, that, it, it makes a lot of sense, man. I, so I would love for you, we, we've talked about this on the show before, but I would love for you to help us understand C. Peter Wagner Kind of two things. One, as kind of the intellectual architect of this NAR movement, what we're seeing now, and also like this idea of a second apostolic age or a second apostolic age, right? Because people would hear that. People maybe listen to the show. They didn't grow up in church or they didn't, they, you know, or they, they did, right? But it was a, not a charismatic church or something like that. They'd be like, what apostle? What are we talking about? What, what age, what, I mean, what is like, that's a lot of like, uh, it can be very like a uh, jargony to make up a word. Right. And in terms of like, uh, people don't, may not understand what that actually means when we say that. Cause, cause it feels like his work, see Peter Wagner, you said he's like almost arguably the main character of your book to essentially set the foundation, created the foundation on which all of this is, is growing. And and people are finding their theological justification. So help us understand C. Peter Wagner, and and I guess you know I I I want you to like I'll I'll kind of just let you answer that. But but the spiritual warfare thing, I I have some questions about that. But you can go ahead uh, first with the C. Peter Wagner. But I, I just want to dig into that a little bit too, if we can. Yeah. Um... C. Peter Wagner, Charles Peter Wagner, was a, a seminary professor. Um, he was a convert to Christianity. His, his, in fact, his future wife, Doris, was the one who led him to Christianity. Um, and and it's, I mean, it's a funny story. She tells she she thinks that he's you know, he wants to marry her because he, he she she he, and, and he's willing to convert to Christianity just to marry her. And she says, actually, I, I'm going to become a missionary, trying to kind of discourage him. He's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll do that too. I love cows. I'm sure they have cows wherever you're going. Like right. He, so he's he's he kind of is just just a strange character. Spends 15 years in Bolivia as a missionary, comes back, becomes a seminary professor um, at Fuller Theological Seminary, which is my alma mater. Um, we didn't overlap there. He, he left a few years before I got there. But um, he was uh, an expert in church growth, which was this very faddish, um, evangelical, you could almost call it a science, a, a, a style of theology. Um, the idea was that you could take um, the learning and the data of social sciences sociology, political science, these, these kind of kind of more developed social sciences, blend that with evangelical theology and then produce growth. Movement, missionary movements that would grow, mega churches that would grow. Um, and they would do things like, well, it, you know, a church grows better if you just focus on one type of person, suburban white families, right? And then you're really going to be able to build a church around that. You shouldn't try to appeal to everyone because you, you aren't going to get there. If you just appeal to this one kind of group, then you can grow. And, and Wagner was fixated on this idea. How do you, how do you produce growth? 
And over the course of the 1980s, he began to discover these Pentecostal charismatic movements and recognize, oh, wow, this is, there's a lot of energy here. There's a lot of leadership. There's a lot of potential here. And he came to believe that that was the arena of church growth of the 21st century. That if you could just harness the energy of that area, then you could create real growth in the church and bring about a global revival. And some of the ideas that have been percolating around that area for since the 1950s was about this idea of the rebirth of the offices of apostles and prophets that that you could that, that God in the 20th century would would renew the work of apostles and prophets and Wagner starts hanging out with these people like Cindy Jacobs like Dutch Sheets who claim that they are prophets or apostles and then he gets prophesied over and he comes to believe that he is an apostle um, and so when he talks about the second apostolic age. As he's, as he's formulating these ideas of the New Apostolic Reformation, these theories about it, he comes to believe that starting in 2001, which is right after he really retires and starts trying to, to, to pursue this stuff full time, he believes that is, is this new era of the church on the level of um, the, the Protestant Reformation in the way that it will revolutionize the, the landscape of global Christianity. And to be fair, he's not wrong. Right? He, in fact, Peter Wagner, um, for all of the harmful effects he's had, I think, on our culture, was, was a man before his time. He recognized that, that there was a, a massive change going on in global Christianity. He recognized that there was this trend of these apostles and prophets, and, and th there's a broader apostolic and prophetic movement. The NAR is just kind of one brand or one set of networks in this much bigger landscape of, of these apostolic and prophetic or five-fold ministry movements that are sweeping the globe right now. This is the fastest growing sector of global Christianity. This is the fastest growing sector of American Christianity. Peter Wagner was on to something. Now, he also gets drawn into that and becomes, in many ways, a true believer and participant in that and then gets these real delusions of grandeur and comes to believe not only are we supposed to reform the church, not only are we supposed to transform the way church is done, we need to take over the world. We need to take over the rest of society and build the kingdom of God on earth. And that's where the NAR over time becomes increasingly politically radicalized. And he he's, he's both a product of that radicalization and an instigator of that radicalization. Man, that is that's so well said because I was just thinking about how yeah he predicted it, but also he was he produced it right in part right he helped produce this by giving theological justification and laying the groundwork um, for this. So I, I I think that's really well said. Thinking about concepts like the militarization of Christianity, like this idea of spiritual warfare, generals that are fighting the great, you know, grand demons, things like that, like coming out of this, like talk to us a little bit about that. And I, I guess one thing that's in my mind is that the New Testament, right, does have some military kind of language, for instance, the armor of God, right? You get this uh, Paul is speaking about, you know, using armor from the Roman soldier, right? Typical Roman armor to talk about putting on the armor of God or the struggle is not against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities, this kind of metaphorical language for sure, but kind of military language. Um, what kind of wrestle with that, you know, with that concept, like, Here's what the New Testament says. Here's what people are saying. The generals, like essentially, why is it wrong for this kind of military military kind of metaphor and language to be used by Christians? What's concerning about that? And is it is it different than what we kind of see in the New Testament? Yeah, let me let me put on two hats for, for this answer. The yeah, first, go ahead, just, please. just as, as, as an American citizen, a participation in, in, in our civic uh, conversation as, as it, somebody, as a Christian who cares about uh, American democracy in our society, I think it's, it's, it's extremely uh, um, uh, painful 
to watch this militarization of Christianity. And I think it, it has sure. contributed very, very directly to our polarization. You have more and more Christians thinking in more and more militant terms. And, and especially as you start layering in these ideas of demons and the demonic and, and the, the spiritual warfare, when you introduce these ideas of spiritual warfare into a polarized political populace and tell people your enemies are inspired by demons, the Democrats are the Democrats, and we need to stop the demons. It, cre it f creates even more polarization because people don't think that they ever need to compromise. And it's, it's antithetical to democracy in many ways, because democracy is about, hey, look, <laughs> we're all in this together. We're going to disagree a lot, but we have systems to adjudicate our disagreements and to help us kind of navigate that. So just, just as, as a civic matter, I think that that's a lot of what's going on here. Now, putting on my theologian's hat. I think we always have to think about the context in which the New Testament is being written. It is being written by disempowered people who are living in the context of empire, who are living in the context of colonization, right? The, the early church, the early Christian church is a colonized group of people. They are coming from the dregs of Roman society. They are people who, I mean, Jesus is executed by the Roman empire for political reasons, right? It's not, it's not his theology that gets him killed. It is that he is perceived as a threat to the Roman ruling order in Judea and that they don't want to have any more rebellions um, by the Jewish people. And so they're, they're in the business of executing messiahs just to prove they aren't messiahs, right? And so Jesus is, is a victim of this colonial military industrial complex. As that's going on, though, people in the, the, the New Testament, the, the, the different writers of the New Testament, are also watching these military things that are going around, on around them, this, this empire that's, that's playing out around them, and sometimes using metaphors from that, right? In Ephesians chapter 6, as you were citing, right, the, the armor of God, and, and, and right, the, the author of Ephesians is looking at the Roman army and saying, like, oh, this is a metaphor for how we as Christians can stand against the, the powers of darkness, right? And in some ways, I mean, if you, I think if you read that in context, some of the powers of darkness are the Roman Empire itself, right? They're not, they aren't always spiritualizing this. They, and, and if you read the book of Revelation, right, there's military imagery, but it's often directed at the military powers and saying that Jesus's empire, the, the kingdom of God, supplants the, the, the kingdoms of this world with a reign of peace and mercy, right? That Jesus, the enthroned one, is also the, the, the crucified lamb, right? That, that, um, and so the, there's always this interplay between military imagery and then the inversion of worldly power to, to describe the Christian way of being. I think where the NAR and many of these other independent charismatics who adopted this, this hyperactive spiritual warfare ideation and, and, and political mobilization is that they, they've mistaken the metaphors for directives. And so they, they come to believe that, that Jesus, they're like, oh, Jesus conquers everyone in the end, so we need to conquer everyone now. But Jesus doesn't conquer everyone in the end, right? If you go, go and read the text, Jesus comes back and Jesus is always who he was. Right? He is the merciful one. He's the gracious one. The one who goes to the cross is the one who will judge humanity because he knows humanity. And so I think they're, they're, the, the, part of the tragedy of what is going on is that they have, and this is a pattern throughout Christian history, they've turned Jesus who fled from every nominating party that ever came to him into a pol politicized weapon of war. They've turned Jesus, the crucified one, into a cross they can crucify other people on. And that is that is such a bastardization of the Christian gospel, in my view. It's not heresy, because <laughs> they're saying their creeds, they're, they're doing their, their, their Christian things, but it is a, 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 a such a harmful and, and deleterious vision of Christianity that is about earthly power in a way that I think is just antithetical to the teachings and character of Jesus. Wow. Like that'll preach. I got to tell you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, I mean, Josh is a pastor. He, he knows how to draw that out of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like sometimes like, cause I, I, I go to Josh's church. Sometimes he'll be preaching 
and you'll say something. And I'm like, he got that from our guest. Like, I know that. Like, that line, <laughs> you know, like, in order to be American, you have to be Christian. In order to be Christian, you have to be American. I was like, like, one of our guests said that. <laughs> Take so, your inspiration from wherever you can, Josh. So uh, so I'm looking forward to, to hearing what you just said, Matt, translated into a sermon, um, you know. And yes, thanks for my sermon for this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> in days to come. You know, so so as, as we get kind of like closer to time here, I, I have to ask you, like, um, are there like trends, you know, anything that's sort of like that you're seeing that would lead you to believe that this movement um, is is on the upswing or or on the downswing, uh, because, you know, I, I know that you did a lot of research study for this for this book. You're kind of like tracing, chronicling kind of this this movement. Um, but but my guess is that at some point in time, that movement early on, like died out somehow um, or may, maybe there is just like a, a little little bit of DNA and it's still floating through the universe and, and it's being picked up by other people. So, like, I'd, I'd, I'd love to, to get your. I don't know, prediction, um, if you will, um, on whether or not this movement is is growing or shrinking. If you go and try to read about the New Apostolic Reformation online, you're going <laughs> to find some very strange ideas about the NAR online. And I think some of that has to do with this very diffuse architecture that Wagner designs for his movement. Um, and he doesn't want to be the center of the movement. He really does want to create this kind of oligarchic model where all these people he's mentoring, all these apostles and prophets kind of share power. And so it's not, it's not a, sometimes people will say, oh, the NAR is a cult. It doesn't, it doesn't function the way that a personality cult does because that's, that's not, that's not how they wanted it to be. And in many ways, the, the NAR sort of died with Peter Wagner. I mean, this was his terminology. He was the one who was lo- in love with talking about the New Apostolic Reformation. A few of his followers have continued using that terminology, but a lot of them have moved on. Um, and and there, it, this is operating in a world that has uh, the memory of a goldfish. I mean, they're, they're, right, the non-denominational charismatic space, there's always new ideas floating around. There's always new um, uh, prophecies. There's always new uh, concepts, new books, new leaders pushing new ideas out there. And so the NAR is kind of a brand name that died out. But the ideas and the leaders that, that Peter Wagner mentored and, and the ideas that he cultivated are thriving right now. Um, my colleague, Paul Jupe, who's a political scientist at Denison University and I, in, in January, we put together a survey and we took seven statements um, that come out of NAR theology, ideas that I grew up evangelical. These ideas were stuff you just didn't hear about when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s in American evangelicalism. Things like apostles and prophets exist today and should be integral to leadership in the church. Or there are high-level demons that control literal physical territory and need to be cast out, right? I mean, these are kind of out there ideas. Six out of seven of these statements that we put out found more than 50% agreement among American evangelicals, right? So these things that were fringy, 10, 15 years ago, are now mainstream. And the leaders that Wagner mentored, the people and the characters of my book, who are I, I call the theological architects of the Capitol riot, are more popular today than they've ever been. They're more popular today than they were on January 6th. And in fact, January 6th has, has in some ways catapulted them into even greater fame and even greater notoriety in the circles that respect them. And so I think there's a... Um, we uh, to answer your question quite directly the the name NAR has died out the ideas of the NAR are on an unbelievable upswing in american culture and american christianity and um in fact i i am in contact with um journalists and activists all over the country um and and constantly talking to to reporters who are tracking this stuff and what we're seeing right now is not only the spread of NAR spiritual warfare paradigms and leadership concepts into broader evangelicalism, that is going on very rapidly. We are also seeing the spread of these same ideas into the militia movement in America and white national yeah. groups. And um, I, I talked to, to reporters who, who, are say, who monitor some of these far-right militia groups, and they say, you know, a year or two ago, we were watching these folks online and all the videos they were posting on social media were all of them playing with their weapons. Very standard kind of malicious type stuff. 
Now, the last six to 12 months, it's all videos of them getting baptized. But they don't drop the militia rhetoric. They don't, they're not repenting of being militia members. They're getting baptized as militia members. And then now after that, they adopt this spiritual warfare rhetoric. And so they're layering on this sort of theological, spiritual radicalization on top of their existing political radicalization. And so the government is not only tyrannical, the government is demonic, right? And that is something that deeply, deeply worries me because that convergence that we're seeing, and, and this, is, this is true across the board, right? After January 6th, many of these disparate elements of the far right in America that all converged on January 6th have all started to intermingle. Right? And now you're hearing NAR leaders adopting sort of QAnon talking points. Now you're hearing militia groups blending QAnon and kind of NAR independent charismatic spirituality. Now you're, you're hearing um, some of these very um, political organizations like Turning Point USA adopting theological frames from the NAR, like the Seven Mountains, in order to structure and guide their far-right activism around Donald Trump. And so that is part of what worries me, is that, that the far-right is far more integrated today than it was on January 6th. And the fever pitch of anger and emotion is, is at least at the level it was in leading up to January 6th, if not worse. Man. Earth 316. I'm telling you, <laughs> there's something so, to it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I hear that. So, Matt, what what is your hope for this book? What do you hope that it accomplishes? What kind of conversations would you want to hear about that may would make you think, oh, that that means that my my book has made the difference I wanted it to make? I, I wrote this book very purposefully, and I hope that it's successful in this. I, I tried as hard as possible not to alienate anybody, not to, to, to replicate the culture wars that we have, not to say, oh, we're, I, I'm one of the good Christians, and here are all the bad Christians, and we can just denounce the bad Christians, not to say evangelicals are the problem, or charismatics are the problem. I'm trying to be very, very targeted in saying, here are the leaders who brought us to where we are today. And here's the culture, the subculture that they have helped to inculcate around Donald Trump. Here are, here's the propaganda messaging that they have used to popularize Donald Trump among American Christians. Because I want, I want people to have that knowledge, but I also want um, the rest of us Christians to understand what we're, who we need to persuade. Jim Wallace has this great, great concept of, in, in politics, you need to figure out who you need to persuade and who you need to defeat. And I think coming into this election, and especially the aftermath of this election, the NAR is going to need to be defeated. Because they are gearing up to do, if, if Trump loses, they are gearing up to do again what they did at the end of 2020 and early 2021. To wage a spiritual warfare battle to put Donald Trump in office by hook or by crook. If Trump wins... They will be some of the key advisors pushing him to the, the most extreme Christian nationalist policies you can imagine and, and advocating for that from the inside of the Trump administration. So I think they need to be defeated. But many of their followers, many of their fellow travelers, many other leaders in the independent charismatic world can be persuaded. There are a lot of people in that world who have deep qualms about what they're seeing. And I've gotten to know a lot of the, the, the leaders in that. I'm even in, in, involved in some efforts to try to bring together a coalition of Pentecostal and charismatic leaders who will speak out about this stuff, who will challenge this stuff, um, will speak out against political violence and say, no, that is not acceptable, right? If, if, if Jesus, if, 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 if the way of Barabbas, right, the, 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 the insurrectionist who is going to be crucified alongside instead of Jesus, if the way of Barabbas was not acceptable against the Roman Empire, if insurrection and sedition against this brutal empire was not acceptable to the early church, then why would insurrection and sedition be acceptable in a pluralistic democracy where people have plenty of representation and power? Right? But the the the, the cultivated ideas and the, the, the cultivated fears of the religious right have brought many, many Christians into a state of discombobulation. I mean, one third of Americans believe the 2020 election was stolen. Two thirds 
of um, white evangelicals believe the 2020 election was stolen. They are living in unreality. And I think the task for the rest of us Christians is not to make fun of them, not to act like they're stupid, not to denounce them, but to engage them in dialogue. And I, I, I'm under no illusion about how easy that will be. I mean, it, it, this is very hard stuff. But that is what it takes, I think, to, to, to repair the rifts in our society. Because so much of what is polarizing and d- dividing our society is a theological and theopolitical fight that's going on internal to American Christianity. It's happening inside American Catholicism. It's happening inside American Protestantism. It's happening inside Eastern Orthodox communities. But we need to find ways for centrist and liberal Christians and conservative Christians who reject Christian nationalism to speak to Christian nationalists and persuade them. And I think in order to do that, we need to understand where they're coming from. You're muted, Josh. You can count me in on that uh, coalition uh, because I am charismatic and I am a Pentecostal in theology. And uh, I also am very disturbed by what's going on. Um, So for whatever that's worth, uh, any way that I can help, I want to do that. So, but how can people connect with you and how can they get the book? The book is available anywhere fine books are sold. Um, you can order, pre-order it on Amazon. It comes out on October 1st. People who pre-order it should be able to get it before October 1st. I, I don't quite understand how, how publication dates actually work with, with shipping dates, but somehow that's a thing. Um, and um, I, I also work at the Institute for Islamic, Christian, and Jewish Studies in Baltimore. You can find us at icjs.org. You can, uh, we, we do all kinds of educational programming around interreligious dialogue around the history of Muslim, Christian, Jewish relations, around American politics, around anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and Christian nationalism. And you can just sign up on our website. Um, we, we, we're trying to do more and more stuff, especially around the election about democracy. Um, and I'm on Twitter, at Taylor Matthew D. I'm on Substack. Um, people can, can find me just about anywhere. Wait, so... You said we could find your book wherever fine books are sold. But like if you go to a bookstore that doesn't have fine books, do you think we could still find your book there? Let me put it this way. I don't think I'm going to be on the shelves of very many Christian bookstores, (laughs) even though I'm explicitly (laughs) writing to Christians. I, I was I, actually I was on vacation um, a couple a few weeks ago in in um, uh, Tennessee. And um, I, I went into a Christian bookstore and I, I grew up going to Christian bookstores. I was shocked. I was shocked. The, 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 the t-shirts they were selling in this Christian bookstore that was branded as a Christian bookstore were so anti-Democrat, were so like explicitly political, explicitly <laughs> really? pro-Trump, explicitly denying the 2020 election being marketed as Christian books and as Christian paraphernalia. Um, so, I mean, so the, I don't think they'll be, they'll be putting my books on the shelf in there anytime <laughs> soon, but any, anywhere that you would normally buy books, you can get mine. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Matt. It's always a pleasure to uh, get a chance to catch up and talk with you. I'm, I always learn something new every time we we have a conversation. And and your book is uh, fantastic. So um, if you haven't pre-ordered it, do it. If you haven't bought it, buy it. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again for everything, Matt. I really appreciate this. Thank you guys so much. I always love coming on here. <laughs> and uh, to our, our listeners and watchers, uh, remember uh, to keep your conversations not right or left, but up. And we will see you next time. Take care. Hey there, Josh Bertram here, faithful host of the Faithful Politics Podcast. I want to let you know about a compelling new spinoff, the Faith Roundtable, where I'll be interviewing top faith leaders, theologians, and scholars to unpack the pressing issues that are shaping the church in America today. We'll dive into topics like faith in public life, social justice, and how we can engage our communities more effectively. Make sure you don't miss any of our enlightening conversations by subscribing to it on our YouTube channel. Join me at the Faith Roundtable, where deep discussion meets thoughtful insight.